introduce today's speaker because uh, uh, I hesitate to say how many years I've known him. Uh, I don't even remember what, what year you start the school, but anyway, we started the 10th Street School together and went all through 10th Street School and uh, we were together at uh, uh, Oki and then he took a side trip over to uh, GMA, which is now Woodley. Uh, and then we were back, back together in, in Boys High School. Uh, when we finished Boys High, I went on to Tech, and he went on to University of Georgia. And we didn't see each other until, uh, what, about four years ago, I guess it was, at a Boys High School reunion. And uh, we've seen each other fairly occasionally since then. And it's a real pleasure. He's one of our good members, and, and some of our best programs have come from him. And uh, so uh, I'm not going to uh, tell much about him because what, what I've asked him to do today is to not only tell a little bit about his World War II experiences, but tell about this interesting life that he's, he's lived overseas most of the time. He's, he's now living in Marietta, and he still goes overseas a lot. So uh, I think you'll find him a fascinating person, and it's a real pleasure for me to uh, present to you Melvin Bryant. later, four cruisers were sunk. Nine hundred and some odd men died in 32 minutes in a night engagement. It seemed at the time unbelievable because we all had heard about the Japanese. They couldn't see at night. They didn't have good range finders. When they came in, they encountered this American force which had been split into three separate divisions. They just went down one division after the other. Three American cruisers, one Australian cruiser. Then what happened? Well, the Marines were stranded. Had the Japanese proceeded into the area where the freighters were, it would have been a, a disaster that nobody could have recovered from. But unfortunately, a few planes took off from New Maya and uh, New Caledonia. They had come up to Buttons, which is Ifati. They came over, and the Japanese had an idea that the carriers were there. They weren't carrier planes. They were B-17 reconnaissance, so the Japanese turned and went north. Well, <clears throat> the next thing that happened of importance 
was the fact that this war was fought in a way that people didn't understand. The United States Navy was not prepared, the Air Force wasn't prepared. It seemed at the time that everything that we did didn't seem to work out right. Admiral Beatty was talking once at the Battle of Jutland. After the battle was over, he said, what's wrong with our bloody ships? Well, I don't think there was anything wrong with our ships and anything wrong with our Navy, but we didn't realize in those days that it was going to be an aerial war. Our theory was we kept thinking that the battle was going to go out and engage the Yamato, and we'd be fighting back and forth and that's what we did. The, the island in Guadalcanal is 90 miles long and 50 miles wide. We put 10,000 men ashore. The Japanese only had 3,500. But it took us almost seven months to secure the island. There were six major naval battles. The numbers of ships that were lost on the American side, not counting small ships, was 24. We lost two carriers, Hornet and the Wasp. Fletcher, Admiral Fletcher, was a little bit cautious because he had lost the Yorktown. And uh, then at the end, when I started checking what we had lost, we didn't lose any battleships. The Japanese lost two battleships, old ones, unfortunately. We lost six heavy cruisers. They lost two. We lost 14 destroyers. They lost two battleships, two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and 11 destroyers. Now, where I come into this thing, my group, which was the 307, 324 group, was formed in Washington, the state of Washington, and they flew out and arrived in Guadalcanal on the 20th of February, 1943. I was in a group that was trained in the United States in what they called the phases in those days. You trained at three different bases get your crew together. Then you went to Topeka, Kansas, got your airplane. You probably did it. You checked your airplane out. We checked an airplane out, B-24. I even have the number somewhere. I signed for the automatic pilot in the bomb site, and the pilot signed for the airplane. We left Topeka, Kansas, got lost en route to San Francisco, made an emergency landing at Elko, Nevada, in the United Airlines strip, and it was a Sunday morning, and of course we all jumped out of the airplane, and we were all armed, and everybody in Elko, which was a little bitty town, and they came down to see the airplane. And uh, we had to call up San Francisco, Hamilton Field, to find out how we could get out and how we could get there. Well, the townspeople made a bucket brigade to fuel our plane. We took off this 3,000 foot runway with the flaps down and you remember the, how they did those jump starts, you know, you run up the engines, everything all the way to the firewall, no flaps, start down, and then when she starts to bounce like that, we start milking the flaps down and sort of shut us off. <laughs> well, we did a lot of those, but that was a big one because there was a mountain right there. We got to San Francisco, we were briefed to fly to Hawaii. Four of the men on our crew had never seen an ocean. We spent four days in San Francisco having the plane checked over again. They put an extra engine in the back end of it for us to carry out to Hawaii. We took off in a rainstorm at 7 o'clock at night. They closed the field right behind us. If you know anything about aerial navigation or as it was practiced in those days, it had to be done at night. You couldn't see. Anything that you could have a land of travel, you had to have a star. The only thing you could do with the sun, you could take a sun line which would give you the speed at which you're moving, but it doesn't tell you whether you're going sideways or where you are. But at night, you can get a three star fix and you can put yourself pretty well where you're supposed to be, except, as you know, when you're figuring it, you're moving at 160 miles an hour. So every time you make a two-minute uh, shot, 
you got two minutes shot here, two minutes shot here, two minutes shot here, then you start making all your numbers. You've gone another 50. But of course, we know how to advance that. Anyway, the fight to Hawaii was uneventful. We had a system on these planes called IFF, which if you remember the problem that we had in Iran when uh, uh, we shot down an Iranian passenger plane, the reason they did, they failed to turn on the IFF. They had IFF, which is International Friend of Folk. It's a little radio transmitter. You turn it on, there's a receiver set to receive the IFF. A lot of times in Guadalcanal we had false air raid signals because some fellow would come back and forget to turn on the IFF. But anyway, one of the tricks that we used when we got within our estimate of 50 miles of Hawaii, we had to do a radar dance, which meant our course was this way, we would turn and make a big circle for five minutes to the left on even days and to the right on odd days. That showed the radar operators at Hickam Field who we were. Then when we got within 10 miles of Hickam, here come the fighters. And they sat right with us until we landed. We spent four weeks at Hickam Field. And it was a custom in those days, although our orders were to go to New Caledonia, we were attached to the 7th Air Force at that time. So they would grab us and make us fly searches while they remodeled our airplane. We had a B-24D, which they took the tail turret, put it up in the nose. In the tail, they just put 250s on a track, and they put a ball turret in. I'll tell you about that ball turret later. Uh, we flew... 11 searches out of Hawaii for the 7th Air Force. They would put us in a DC-3, fly us up to the North Coast, give us two bologna sandwiches apiece, and three cans of tomato juice, and they said, go out 700 miles and fly a Y search and come back. And we would do that. And these were old planes that we were flying then, because they were 7th Air Force planes. The quadrant that they were always worried about was the Northwest Quadrant that's where they came in from the attack on Pearl Harbor. So we would be out 700 miles when the sun came up. Behind us, there would be another one about 350 miles out. Because the problem that you sometimes have in searches, you fly over them. And you don't know they're there, you fly over them. That's happened at Midway. The Japanese guy flew over America. And the problem was that when he did recognize the radio but anyway, after that four weeks, they said, all right, next stop, Canton Island. We took off to Canton Island, about 12 and a half hours. Stayed two days in Canton Island. That's just an atoll. It was a Pan American guest area where the Clippers used to come in. From Canton, we flew to Fiji, Fiji to New Caledonia. We had to stop again in New Caledonia while they removed all the de-icing equipment from our plane. That was interesting because New Caledonia was French. Part of the people there were Vichy, the other part of the Gaulle. They had a famous bar there, the Bar of the Pacific. It was 70 feet long. And at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, all the your drinks. You had to order three or four. 